get anybody else, I'll do it. Good evening. And Welcome. So I do. I'm Carol O'Neill, uh, one of the associate deans at the Law Center. And on behalf of Dean Alex Alenikoff, I would like to welcome you to the Georgetown Law Center's annual educational event on the U.S. Armed Forces uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. This policy, which prohibits openly gay men, lesbians, and bisexuals from serving in the military, is inconsistent with the Law Center's policy of requiring employers who recruit here to agree not to discriminate based on sexual orientation. The military is permitted to recruit our students, however, because of a provision in the law known as the Solomon Amendment, which requires school to provide the uh, full access to students for military <coughs> recruiting um, or risk termination of federal funds to the university. This annual educational event is one of the many events uh, that the Law Center undertakes to ameliorate the effects of the Solom Solomon Amendment on our gay, lesbian, and bisexual students. I want to uh, say some thanks before we begin so they don't get lost later on. Special thanks to the men and women of the Armed Forces of Australia, Canada, Great Britain, and Israel who have joined us for the panel this evening, as well as to retired U.S. Navy Captain Michael Rankin who joins us as well. More about our panelists in a moment. This program is co-sponsored by the Dean's Office and several students, student organizations, Outlaw, the Military Law Society, the International Law Society, and the Global Race and Identity Project. I want to uh, say special thanks to Dan Hughes from Outlaw and Tessa Marmion uh, from the Military Law Society. Tessa was welcoming people, I think, um, for all their work on this project. I want to recognize and thank Barbara Moulton, our Assistant uh, Dean for Public Interest and Community Service, who has been a careful shepherdess of, uh, of this project. Uh, particular recognition goes to a member of our community who took on the lion's share of the work, I think, uh, and that is Adjunct Professor Tom Field. As a moderator of this evening's panel, Professor Field will introduce the topic himself and our speakers. And before I turn it over to Tom, I'd like to uh, invite you all to remain after the panel uh, to talk with the panelists and with each other about the topic at a reception <coughs> in the rear of the room. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. <laughs> One administrative announcement. There will be a uh, opportunity circulating among you right now to sign up for the videotape and transcript of the conference so that our immortal words will be available to you in the future. Uh, it'll be circulated to you, one uh, clipboard on the right and one on the left. Welcome to this panel discussion regarding sexual orientation, military preparedness, and the Don't Ask, Don't Tell statute that prevents 65,000 gay and lesbian troops from serving openly. Please think about that figure, 65,000. That's equivalent to one third of our active duty Marines. It's more than three times the number of troops we sent into Baghdad as part of the surge strategy. 65,000 is a big number, but it is a conservative estimate of the number of gay and lesbian troops serving in the US Armed Forces today. <coughs> The background for tonight's panel is the damage to U.S. military preparedness that results from our refusal to allow these troops to serve openly. Tonight, we have four panelists from across the globe to tell us how their militaries made the transition to open service. The experience of those militaries can guide us as we seek 
to enhance our own military readiness. <clears throat> My name is Tom Field. I'm a tax lawyer and a member of your adjunct faculty. I'm also an Army colonel who retired after 32 years of service that began at the time when Senator Joe McCarthy was conducting the witch hunts that resulted in unjustifiable and less than honorable discharges for thousands of gay and lesbian service members. At that time, <clears throat> gays were thought to be mentally unstable and inherently likely to betray the United States. I knew those arguments were false. That's why I continued to serve for three decades, but always in the closet and always unable to tell anyone that I came from the hand of God as a gay man. My discharge papers say that I served honorably and well. I know that to be true. Today, <clears throat> the reasons for discriminating against gays and lesbians have changed. Under congressional mandate, gays are now allowed to serve in the armed forces, provided they tell no one who they really are. That's the rule that Congress has told the military to enforce. Don't ask, don't tell, DADT. DADT is a peculiarly cruel requirement. Imagine what it would be like for you if a congressional mandate forbade you to identify the person you love, made it inadvisable to carry his or her picture in your wallet, or to list their name as the person to be notified if you were killed or injured. That's what DADT does. <clears throat> DADT also undermines U.S. military preparedness in a variety of ways. Most obviously, we have discharged nearly 12,000 troops, the equivalent of an Army Light Division, under DADT. Many of those discharged have been in scarce skill areas, such as linguistics, medicine, and nuclear science. In addition, DADT prevents tens of thousands of qualified young people from considering enlistment or enrollment in college ROTC, resulting in a loss of nearly 41,000 recruits. Finally, and importantly, DADT causes thousands of highly trained, highly qualified officers and enlisted men and women to curtail their military careers voluntarily, even though they have served honorably and well, want to continue to serve, and have skills the military needs. To put that statistic in perspective, Remember that the Iraqi surge involved only five U.S. brigades. And the people who curtail service annually are equivalent to a full army brigade. This evening, in addition to our international panelists, <clears throat> we're also going to hear from an advocatus diaboli, or devil's advocate. For those of you not familiar with Catholic tradition, a devil's advocate was a church official whose job in canonization proceedings was to take a skeptical view of arguments, to look for holes in the evidence, 
and argue a different point of view. That's the job of our advocatus this evening with respect to all the panel presentations, including this one. We're very grateful to him for his willingness to take on this role. All of our panelists are appearing as individuals. <clears throat> their views are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of their organizations or governments. Nevertheless, I am confident that their descriptions of how their respective countries moved to permit open military service by gay and lesbian individuals can provide useful examples for a U.S. military establishment that is desperately short of troops and struggling with the resulting preparedness issues. Starting on my left, <clears throat> our panelists are Stuart O'Brien, who is a serving chief petty officer in the Royal Australian Navy. His 16 years of duty include sea service on Her Majesty's ships Darwin, Melbourne, and Canberra, all of them guided, guided missile frigates. His service also includes two operational deployments in Iraq. The first within the Australian headquarters at Camp Victory, and the second with multinational force Iraq in Baghdad's green zone. <clears throat> Patrick Lister Todd, our second panelist, retired in 1992 as Lieutenant Commander in Britain's Royal Navy after 20 years of service. His active duty included patrol service on HMS Alert, navigation duties on HMS Achilles, and duty as a submarine base operations officer in the Clyde. During his final duty appointment, he was responsible for tertiary Navy training of all young officers. In the late 1990s, he helped to select the plaintiffs for the lawsuit that led the European Court of Human Rights to order Britain to permit open military service by gay and lesbian individuals. Since retirement, he's been engaged in a wide variety of business and charitable activities, including training for life, which among much else, helps homeless ex-service people find routes to employment. Michelle Douglas, our third panelist, joined the Canadian Armed Forces in 1986 as a second lieutenant and served with distinction in the Special Investigations Unit of the Military Police. However, in 1989, she was honorably dismissed from the military because she is a lesbian. She subsequently launched a court challenge to her dismissal, and in October 1992, just before trial, the Canadian military conceded the case. This ended Canada's policy of overt discrimination against gays and lesbians in its armed forces. Michelle now works for the Canadian Department of Justice, Canadian Department of Justice in Ottawa. Adna Ivan Zohar, our fourth panelist, served in the Israeli army from 1987 through 1993. As an army captain, he served on the chief of staff's inspection team for the Army, Navy, and Air Force, and was commander of an education base in Upper Galilee. He also served in the West Bank and in Lebanon. Captain Ivan Zoha was among the very few officers in the Israeli Armed Forces who were twice decorated for highest excellence during their service. Currently, he is a professor and chair of the Department of Hebrew Studies at a university in Monterey, California. Michael Rankin, our advocatus diaboli, 
is a retired U.S. Navy captain who served 24 years as a Navy doctor, including combat tours during the Vietnam War with the Marines in I Corps and the Navy on Yankee Station. Currently, he is clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at George Washington University School of Medicine and a lecturer and mentor at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. We have asked our panelists to adhere to a strict time schedule. So please hold your questions and applause until we've heard from all five speakers. Let's begin now with Stuart O'Brien. Um, firstly, I'd just like to thank Tom for the opportunity to come out and speak to you all uh, this evening. Um, I never thought I'd actually be doing something like this, so it's a, a big honour for me. Um, Tom touched briefly on some of my background as well. I've also worked within the Director of Sailors Career Management, the Director, of Ge uh, Director General of Naval Personnel and Training, um, and my current role is the Staff Officer of Research for Navy Personnel Research. Um, so I've got a pretty broad experience on personnel perspectives and, and how people sort of interact within the services and, and what the drivers are to keep and, and push people out the doors as well. Um, I'll, I'll start off at the beginning, you know, 1992, I joined in 1990, so it's actually 18 years service, not 16. Um, 1992, the, the Australian government um, made its decision to direct defence to remove the policy on banning homosexuals from serving. Um, this was, it, it was more based on um, not from court cases that were going through the system as well for people that had been discharged. Ours was more based on our international ob obligations with human rights. Um, the, it was a Labor government, so a more democratic government <coughs> at the time, um, and, the, and they directed the, the chiefs to remove the policy, um, and it happened. It was, I wouldn't say it was an overnight thing, but it happened. Um, there, there was a lot of uh, <coughs> issues there at the time as well, because it was Big Brothers just told us that we can't do this anymore. But it didn't take long for that just to go away and, and to be no issues. Um, we've been talking the last couple of days and this is a non-issue anymore in Australia. It, it just does not seem to be a, a key driver at all. Um, I said earlier today to, to the group that um, once the ban was removed, little or nothing really changed. People still stayed hidden um, um, as, it was, it was, as it was easier for them to then uh, face harassment and discrimination. Um, but there, didn't, there wasn't a spike in harassment either. Once the ban was lifted, you know, there was no targeting of gays and lesbians either because, well, now they're open, we can... We can target them a, a bit more. Um, that didn't happen. Um, so the harassment that was happening prior to the ban um, was probably still there. Um, again, I've been really lucky in my whole career where I've never faced any discrimination or any harassment of any form. So uh, whether that's just myself or if that's the Australian culture as well. Um, but um, most of the, most people before the ban was lifted already knew of the members that were gay and lesbian as well. So again, it didn't really have any impact, uh, well, a great deal of impact. Sorry, I've had a flu for the last couple of days, so my throat's still killing me. Um, for me, on a personal side, um, you know, two years after I joined the Navy, the ban was lifted, but it wasn't until the mid-90s where I really discovered my sexuality. Um, I was almost engaged at one stage to a, to a wonderful woman. Um, who probably helped me wake up and realise that, yes, I am gay, <laughs> stop trying to hide the fact, um, so, which was really great. And, I mean, we remain very close friends to this day. Um, as I said, did it have any effect on my naval career? Um, I don't think so. I've been promoted minimum time. Um, I've received several commendations. Um, I was honoured to receive the US Meritorious Service Medal um, for my last deployment to the Middle East from the US Army. Um, so. Do I think that it's had any impact? None at all. Um, if anything, I think it's because I can be honest with myself, I can be honest with everybody, so um, it, it's made me a better person. Um, 
to, around the, the mid 90s, um, harassment and discrimination was on the on the books a fair bit. You know, we were looking at it more closely, and that that then introduced the Defence Equity Organisation, and their key role was to look at equity and diversity issues within the Defence Force. Um, we did have other organisations similar to that prior to this, um, but this group really stood up and, and took charge of the issues. Um, so all harassment and bullying issues and that sort of stuff were taken on. Um, they could be addressed straight away. Reporting tools were put into place to eliminate discrimination on all counts. Um, so, and people felt more comfortable then as well on reporting discrimination um, because they knew that it would be kept confidential and it would be followed up. Um, so there were ways through if, if you were suffering for some form of discrimination or bullying, there were ways ahead that you could get through that and the issues would be resolved. Um, in um, 2003, this is this is out of the blue as well. In 2003, um, we had the Defence Force introduced a training package entitled "Understanding Homosexuality." Did we need it? Probably not. But it was a good tool they've introduced, um, and it, it's not for everybody. It's not a compulsory package. It's there for people that don't understand the issues, and it's more there for managers and, and line managers so that they can realise. Um, when they're talking to their troops, don't talk about the wife or the husband, talk about partners, um, to give a more generalised version so we're not discriminating, discriminating against people. Um, be more inclusive, that sort of thing. So it really opened the door and gave them some more information there. Um, but that, that was a huge step forward, um, I, I believe, for, for the gays and lesbians in the military because we showed some leadership, we showed some really strong leadership by producing this, this package. Um, and uh, with, with really good results as well. The service chiefs that um, have commented on it have all said that it's an outstanding training package. So, um, I'm, I'm trying to, I had a 16 page brief that I'd done up and Tom's cut it down on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, in 2001, I met my, my partner, Christopher. Um, at the time, same-sex couples in the military weren't recognised. Um, in 2002, we decided that we'd fight that. Um, we started lobbying um, within the services. We didn't go outside to, to courts or anywhere else. We wrote our application in, internal. Um, it was denied the first time, which we knew it would be. Um, the problem with our, our policy at the time was it uh, put de facto down as opposite sex couple for recognition. And this, the recognition we're talking about here is for defence housing, relocation, separation allowances and reunion travel. Um, so, so it's a big deal when you're looking at families, especially families where the civil, civil partner, the civilian partner, has children, or well, those children therefore aren't recognised by the serving member um, and by defence. So th there's a lot of key issues there. Um, so 2002, we started to fight the system. Um, we kept getting knocked back. And I was luckily, um, our sex discrimination commissioner, Prue Goward at the time, attended defence and was giving a brief on, I think it was women in the military. Um, and, and at the end, she opened the floor and asked questions uh, if we had any, and my question was, was she aware that the Australian Defence Force was using the Sex Discrimination Act, an act designed to stop discrimination, to discriminate against same-sex couples? She didn't, she wasn't aware. Um, so that, that was quite interesting. Did she actively do anything after that? Um, I'd have to say no. She did write back to me a, a few weeks later um, and said that while this piece of government legislation, federal legislation, stated the definition of de facto, defence could choose their own definition um, because defence's policy was an internal policy. Again, we used that to fight the system. The response back from the current Chief of Defence was that our hands are tied until government change that piece of legislation, we won't do anything. So we sat back and thought, OK, well, nothing's going to happen for a few more years until the next election comes up, if, a, if Labor got back in. Um, during that time as well, um, a lot of people knew that, that I was fighting the system and also a lot of other people were fighting as well to try and get their relationships recognised. Um, DEFCLIS was born. DEFCLIS is the Defence Gay and Lesbian Information Service. It's a, a non-official um, organisation that we run in Australia um, and it, it's run from about 13 volunteers. It's a website. It's designed to give a list of resources around the country in every state and capital, um, whether they be counselling services, sporting, um, uh, sporting groups, um, 
medical facilities, uh, the AIDS councils who provide a whole heap of <coughs> great resources as well. Um, but it was a resource tool um, which was really important. What we found was that our defence community organisation was using the information as well because they really had no idea where to go for, for gay and lesbian personnel. We have our own psychologists within the services, we have our own social workers within the services as well. But um, this, this was just another tool that they could use. Um, in, a, in a true show of leadership, um, Angus Houston, our current chief of the Defence Force, he, he came into the chair in 2005. Um, he changed the policy on de facto. Um, it wasn't directed <coughs> by the government. Um, it was an internal policy, as I said, and he made the call. Um, him and the secretary sat down and and did it. I asked him, in, uh, he came and visited me in, uh, or visited the troops in the Middle East when I was over there the first time and I asked him the question as to why did he change the policy. Um, he said, well, it was the right thing to do. It was time. Um, it took us all by surprise. We never thought that that would happen, uh, not until the elections anyway. Um, my time in, and I, I just want to touch on, I've been given the five minutes. Um, my time in Iraq uh, was really, I, I valued I valued that time. The first time I was there, as Tom said, I was with the Australian headquarters. I still had some mixing with the American service personnel that were over there at the time, but not, not as much as I did my second tour um, when I was working out of the US Embassy with MNFI headquarters. Um, that, that's there when I realised that, you know, these, the, the young men and women of the US services have no one to talk to over there. Um, one, of, one of my close friends that I made while I was there, he was in Australia a couple of weeks ago. And he told me the story, and again, I'd totally forgotten all about it until he mentioned it again. Um, he lost his partner while he was in Iraq. Um, he, he was serving with another unit in Iraq, um, so they weren't in the same units. Um, but he had no one he could talk to. Um, so for him, knowing that the Australians were there and, and he would come and talk to us, um, was so important that the door was open, that he knew that he would be safe if he talked to us about his sexuality and, and his, his same-sex partner. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I got caught up when he was telling this to my partner, you know, because I'd totally forgotten that the incident actually happened. Um, but that, that just shows that we're really... Uh, we're all individuals. We're all, you know, we're all here to do the one job. Um, and a common theme that I, something that I've been saying ever since this sort of came up was, if you can do the job, then do the job, because your sexual orientation has nothing to do with that. Um, it, it should never have been an issue. Uh, one of the key questions that we were asked, you know, do we segregate you, do we put you in frontline operational deployments, or do we keep you in the background because you're gay? And I'm going like, well, we don't ask the question anyway, so <laughs> they wouldn't know who was gay and who wasn't. Um, but yeah, um, I think I'll wrap it up there. Um, on return to Australia, I'm, I'm moving positions. I'm heading up to Cuttable to be the new personnel officer at one of our busiest bases, which I'm not really looking forward to. <laughs> Too many problems there to deal with. But, um, but yeah, no, this, this has been a valuable you know, insight for me to come over here and, and tell you guys what we've been doing back home and where we're at in Australia. Uh, for uh, information, 2008 was the first time that Defence Leadership approved and endorsed the Defence Gay and Lesbian members to march in the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. Um, huge step. Uh, not in uniform, which was probably a good thing because there's no way they could have marched straight in, in a straight line <laughs> if we were, because they were all caught up in the moment and everyone was, you know, running up and down the streets cheering the crowd on. But it was important from the fact that when the community noticed that it was a defence force float marching up Oxford Street as part of the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, the, the cheer and, and the, the applause and that was incredible. It was just overwhelming. And um, I know myself as the organiser and... Um, and that, that I got caught up quite a few times, you know, the tears were, I was trying to hold them back because it was just such an emotional night that we did this and we got here. Um, but that, that was a huge step for us, you know. There was only 80 of us, but that, that was still pretty big numbers when you consider, you know, we, we do have a small defence force. And not many people knew. <laughs> so next year I can guarantee that that number will probably double. <laughs> but, um, Thank you, Stuart. Our next panellist is Patrick Lister-Tudd, who will report on Britain. 
Thank you, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got 15 minutes. In fact, if I cheated, I could probably nick uh, one of your minutes as well, um, to focus on our agenda questions and uh, therefore keep away from some of the more juicy aspects of the uh, British campaign to lift our own ban. Um, I'll, I'll therefore stick to the bare bones of what happened at the time and subsequently. Now, in Britain, we fought a five-year campaign to persuade our government to lift its ban on gay people being allowed to serve in our armed forces. And in the end, we had the rather unfortunate edifice of they um, and our military being dragged, to a large extent, kicking and screaming to the European Court of Human Rights, where, as everyone expected, they lost. And just to set the record straight, I should add that this was Tony Blair's government. Um, in opposition, his Labour Party had a policy that stated that it saw no reason why there should be a ban. But it did acknowledge that there were difficult issues surrounding it that would need to be tackled. So rather than lifting it on forming his government, it was felt better to allow the case then at the European Court to run its full course. And that then precluded, um, in the final analysis, any mass falling on swords by our own chiefs of staff when the inevitable result was announced. And that's how it was. On the 12th of uh, January, I was there, uh, 2000, in a packed House of Commons. Our then Defence Secretary, Jeff Hoon, made a statement lasting little more than 10 minutes that lifted our ban. And no new legislation was required, and from our perspective, this finally consigned to the dustbin of history the last element of state discrimination in terms of military employment practices. So it followed on from what we'd seen in the past about racism, bullying, uh, hazing, sexism, misogyny, all of which are deemed unacceptable practices in a modern armed force. <coughs> meant that for the first time gay men and women who had always served in the military could now do so without fear for their own jobs, their reputation, their self-esteem. Sexual orientation had become essentially a private matter for the individual. Now, one of the main arguments put up by our government and their public supporters, who were largely retired senior officers, had been that the loss of the ban would result in a fall in operational effectiveness or preparedness, that many key personnel would retire early, that units would be split, that team cohesion would be lost, and so forth. And we used to argue that that would not so result, and as it turned out, we were right. There were not mass resignations. Operational effectiveness, if anything, increased. And that's not difficult when you consider that during one unhappy quarter in the mid-90s, we lost three Nimrod pilots, two Nimrod navigators, two Tornado, and two Buccaneer pilots from the RAF alone, all found out, investigated, and dismissed. Now, that affected our military preparedness. And it's quite aside from being an enormous drain on the public purse, the British taxpayer. Mm -hmm. The thing which many of those who opposed getting rid of the ban lacked was a finger on the actual pulse of the junior serving man and woman. And I have to say, it was often due to their own entrenched prejudices or bigotry. And that is not to say that they were bad people, just perhaps ill-informed or a product of their times and their generation. They were truly unaware of the sentiment of junior ranks and NCOs. And these people were far more open-minded <laughs> in reality than they so supposed. So when our ban went and a new code of conduct was introduced to govern sexual behavior among service personnel, the result was, well, pretty much nothing. Life went on. People continued to do the sometimes difficult or dangerous jobs for which they had volunteered. And yes, a few older NCOs and officers grumbled amongst themselves, but arguably they'd probably been the same ones who'd been grumbling when women had first been allowed to serve front line. And to be quite honest, the Minister of Defence rather hoped that they wouldn't have to do a great deal in the years um, ahead then. Um, 
thanks to the courage and moral stance and the leadership which the Australians had already given us, um, and in particular one young Lieutenant Commander, um, the armed forces were required to take the lifting of the ban a little bit more seriously. And today we have an evolved tri-service equality and diversity organisation. We have an annual sponsored conference for serving LGBT personnel, normally addressed by Three Star. Um, we have service LGBT forums, um, 7,500 unit equality and diversity advisors trained. That's training still going on. A unified complaints procedure aimed at eliminating harassment and workplace discrimination, of which there's been remarkably little anyway. And membership, at least for the Navy and the Air Force, I'm afraid that uh, predictably the Army drags its feet, um, of the UK's Workplace Equality Index. There's even a staffed confidential support line, um, as there has been from the outset. And as the Australians, in fact, we've, we've been doing it a bit longer than them, personnel are even allowed to march at the annual Pride Parade in London, although I have to say, slightly embarrassingly, the RN are allowed to do it in uniform, the RAF are allowed to do it in T-shirts, and the poor old army has to shuffle along in uh, their own clothing right at the end. <laughs> Yet it, it's not been plain sailing. Our MOD, like your Department of Defence, is at the best of times a frustrated behemoth. It takes time to adjust to change. Um, if we look at what's not gone right, probably at the moment we've got insufficient monitoring um, across the board, and our reserves have been slower to change, and there's still some harboured bigotry and homophobia there. Uh, I know you've had this one as well. One of the hoary old chestnuts that frequently raises its head, and did so during our came campaign, was that the lack of privacy associated with the military life, including communal showers, cramped living quarters, would make it difficult for straight and gay personnel to serve together. To which I would retort, ten years ago, why? And I do so again this evening. You've got to remember, these are volunteers you are talking about. These are people who have, been, um, who have joined up and are, and sometimes do, um, give their lives in the service of their country. And it's a bit rich, really, to infer that sexual orientation somehow infers a shortfall in integrity or decency in such an individual. And of course, the reality is that gay men and women have been busy serving and showering and sleeping in close proximity to their straight counterparts since the year dot. It's just that no one's really been aware of who they are, or cared for that matter. And anyway, what do we want to do? Do we want to make them wear coloured armbands? I would suggest that those who find this a difficult issue should be ashamed of themselves, and perhaps they should first examine who truly has the problem. Now, one of our forum questions was, are LGBT personnel treated differently to our other troops in Britain? And I can answer that one very quickly. The answer is no. And why should they be? They're there to do a job. Our final question was, what have been the effects of our new policy on recruitment and retention? I must be honest here and say it's difficult to assess as openly. Um, as I said, our current monitoring needs to be beefed up. However, I can say that we currently need every able-bodied man and woman, woman um, that we can find. Militarily, we are stretched as never before. And having said that, the Navy did try placing just one advert in our gay times uh, the other month, and were delighted to find uh, that at the end of the month, when they did their figures, that recruitment had increased by 20% mm -hmm. in that month. Uh. And I'm sure that there is a lesson to be drawn there. <laughs> And that, perhaps, is the overriding rationale for your removing your ban. It's not just that it is morally and philosophically the right thing to do, but there is a compelling business case for you to do it. And I quote from our own Ministry of Defence policy. The government wants a public service which values and uses the differences that people bring to it. The public sector must also be part of the society it serves. And this will improve recruitment and retention, strengthen teamwork, achieve cost savings, uphold our reputation and build for the future. 
Now, finally, um, I'd just like to leave you with one other quote and two thoughts. And the quote is from our own Admiral Sir Adrian Johns, who is our Head of Naval Personnel and our second Sea Lord. And he said recently, that's an unhealthy way to be, to try and keep a secret life in the armed services. These individuals need nurturing so that they give of their best and are, in turn, rewarded for their effort. Nurture includes the freedom to be themselves. Our mission is to break down barriers of discrimination, prejudice, fear, and misunderstanding. And the two thoughts I leave with you are as follows. Um, I'm quarter American. Um, my, um, I go a bit off script here. My mother was born at Annapolis. Her great uncle was the station commander of Annapolis, Admiral Christie. Yesterday, I went to the Vietnam Vets Memorial and I laid some flowers um, on behalf of myself and my elder brother and sister for one of our cousins um, who we knew and who did not return. And I wonder what his um, cousin, once uh, twice removed, who was General Cousins, who was the US Marine Corps general in charge of all US Marines in Britain during the Second World War, would have thought as well, because we were and are a close family. But that perhaps leads on to this point. The US Armed Forces have a proud and current record, and I believe this fervently, it's not always popular to say it, but I do believe it, of going out and fighting for and then protecting the newly acquired human rights of people, especially those who haven't previously had any. And yet, something strikes me as being profoundly wrong if one hasn't actually sorted out one's own attitude and approach to human rights amongst one's own. We know that racism, sexism, misogyny, bullying, hazing are wrong and repugnant. So why not homophobia too? It is, after all, by definition, an irrational fear. It is born of ignorance and prejudice. How on earth can one profess to be serious about other people's human rights if one hasn't bothered to sort out one's own? And I would say, first remove the beam from thine own eye, etc. The final point is this. Change is always difficult. Um, I've always seen it as the role of our military leaders to deal with difficult problems and to manage them well and to manage change well. That is what they should be good at and that's what they're paid for. Don't ask, don't tell. We all know, including our Diabolus, will not go on forever. That, that's plain and clear. What we, or you, now need, I will put it to you, is some inspired and enlightened leadership in tackling this difficult issue. Both by your new Commander-in-Chief, when he or she comes along, and by the Chairman and Joint Chiefs of Staff, who will then answer to that person and to the democratic will of the American people. Thank you, Patrick, very much. Indeed. Our third panelist is Michelle Douglas from Canada. I'm very honored to be here tonight uh, and quite inspired by my uh, co-panelists. I'm also enormously relieved to be out of the city of Ottawa that is completely buried under snow. Uh, so this is a great relief to be in such a beautiful capital. Um, I also want to say, uh, as I do whenever I'm speaking at law schools, where there's a conference in association with uh, Solomon Amendment amelioration, how proud I am to be uh, uh, part of this activity. Tonight I want to explain some of my personal story so that uh, you can understand how the policy has evolved in Canada. It's very much uh, something I remember uh, very well uh, when you experience and taste discrimination firsthand. It's not something you soon forget. Then I'd like to have a chance to tell you a little bit about how things are now and perhaps uh, reflect that into uh, what's happening here in the U uh, United States. Just to give you some time frame um, so that you can kind of understand when this was happening. Um, 
Canada ended what I call its discrimination by policy uh, 15 years ago. Right? We were at the same time that Australia was, October 1992. Now, I joined the military in 1986. I was uh, very anxious to serve my country. Uh, I didn't have a family tradition of uh, public service uh, in the military, but rather in the civil service. But I was very excited to join the Canadian Armed Forces. And um, I decided to train to be a security officer, which is uh, within the branch of the military police. And in 1987, I received my commission as a second lieutenant, or second lieutenant, as we'd say here. Um, now, during my basic officer training and as I was proceeding through some of my training, um, I want to tell you that I did well, or maybe very well. And uh, shortly I'll explain why that becomes relevant. In fact, I should say that I was the top graduating student in every military course I took. Now, when I joined the military uh, in 1986, I had no idea about the policy relating to gays and lesbians in the military. Really had no need to turn my mind to it. Wasn't something I was told. But I started to think about it a little bit more in about 1987 when I met a woman at a training course I was taking and fell in love with her. It's the first time I was in love. It was a wonderful experience for me. And we started a very discreet relationship. Uh, this woman had been in the military for some time. And she really kind of taught me about what the rules were if you're going to be part of the <coughs> gay club in the military. And essentially those rules were uh, you never betray the group if you're caught and you just don't talk about it. It was a very tight group. But women that I'd been training with, all of a sudden I realized they were in my club too, which was kind of a neat thing. <laughs> now, so this was happening in about 1987 and uh, 1988. I'd like to tell you what the military uh, considered their evolved policy on uh, gays and lesbians was at this time. Um, around the late 80s, they, they amended their policy of an outright ban to say that if you're gay, you can stay, but the following conditions apply. There were four big ones, and they are, you would not be posted, you would never be promoted, you would never receive a pay increase, and you wouldn't get any more training. But you were welcome to stay. <laughs> right. But again, I never really had to think much about that because, you know, I felt quite protected in the kind of club that I was in, and my career was going well. In fact, because I finished at the top of my career military training course as a security officer in the military police, I was posted as the second female uh, officer ever to be posted to a unit known as the Special Investigations Unit. It was actually a great honor. Um, they investigated the most serious of military crimes and allegations of homosexuality. <laughs> so my friends really uh, very, very quickly suspecting I, I may report them or, or um, was a spy or something for the military uh, closed ranks very quickly. I was uh, left out of my club very quickly. And just as a side note, the girlfriend quit the military too. But I wasn't in the Special Investigations Unit for very long. One morning, 1988, my commanding officer came to me. I was posted in Toronto. He told me to gather my things, that we were going to an important meeting in Ottawa, and we were heading to the airport immediately. I packed my briefcase, had no idea what was going on, but I joined him. We went out to the airport, and just before we arrived there, we pulled off to the airport strip, uh, which contained all of the you know, cheesy airport hotels. And I spent the next two days in a hotel room being grilled about my sexual orientation. And I lied. I told them I'm not a lesbian. Well, actually, I never identified as a lesbian. I was just in love with a woman. Mm. But I did tell them um, that I really had no idea what they're talking about. But that didn't suffice. Uh, the military, although they allowed me to go back to work for a short period of time, engaged in quite an intense period of harassment. Every day they would take something else out of my office. My secure cabinet would be gone one day. I'd come back. All of my papers would be gone the next. And finally I told them that I couldn't take that kind of harassment anymore. And they said, fine, then take a polygraph exam to prove it. I was flown to Ottawa that very day. And while strapped to a polygraph uh, chair, um, I simply said to them, that's it, uh, you, you win. I'm telling you, um, I'm in love with a woman. I'm a lesbian. I think maybe the first time I actually uttered those words. 
um, and they didn't know what to do. They, they really expected they were going to get a great fight. But um, I told them I would tell them anything they needed to know about me, but I wouldn't talk about others. And it's a point of pride uh, that I didn't. However, it also cost me my security clearance when they declared that my loyalty to the gay community was greater than it was to my country. And this is a shocking thing for someone who was prepared to um, and volunteered to uh, uh, join the Canadian military. So in 1989, after some kind of administrative uh, wrangling, I was honorably d dismissed from the Canadian Armed Forces under an administrative provision known as 5D. And this is where I think my success in some of the um, earlier training just will, will underscore for you how just incredibly bizarre this, this is. The release item says the following, not advantageously employable due to homosexuality. Again, not advantageously employable due to homosexuality. Uh, you know, they knew I'd been a top candidate, and yet it just didn't matter. So in 1989, um, I launched a, a lawsuit at the federal court. Um, I should also <coughs> say that at that time, I didn't have community support in particular. I didn't know anyone in the gay community. The military uh, women that I knew certainly ha wanted nothing to do with me. There were no real public expressions of support. I did mercifully had, have one member of uh, our federal parliament, Sven Robinson, who, who did an enormous, um, who, who really made enormous efforts to, to help me. But um, he was really the only one. But you know, the timing was curious about when this happened, 1989. It was exactly right because uh, only in 1982, Canada had repatriated our own constitution from the United Kingdom. And in 1985, uh, we put into effect our kind of non-discrimination clause in a, a part of our charter we referred, or part of our constitution we refer to as the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, so we launched a constitutional challenge, really one of the first types of cases where sexual orientation was going to um, uh, be tested under this new charter. And I think the military knew they were about to lose because um, on the eve of what was to be a three-week trial in October 1992, the military settled the case. And one of the proudest things that happened, uh, that, that I'm proud of, um, was that the military immediately restored the full uh, rank of all of those who had been subject to those very, very difficult conditions. They gave them back pay. They restored their dignity. And it was all done simply with an order. That's really how it came down. The chief of defense staff issued that order. And since that order, um, every report, every analysis, every study, um, that's looked at the effect of this decision and the order has found that none of those dire predictions were realized, just as happened in Australia and in the UK. There was no violence, no reduction in recruitment, no harassment, and no one quit. They actually couldn't even give us one single example. Journalists tried to find the one person who said, I've had enough, and they couldn't find them. Canadian military didn't even study it, actually, for some time. So the deputy chief of the US Army looked into it. The RAND Corporation looked into it. And uh, Professor Aaron Belkin from the US also uh, did some analysis on it. And I, I certainly recommend those kinds of um, studies. You can easily find them on the net to just bear out the fact that the dire consequences that were predicted were never realized. I think that the continued rhetoric that military effectiveness will be compromised has never been borne out. That, that remains. I believe it's one of the most specious um, arguments advanced by supporters of today's don't ask, don't tell. So two key elements that made the transition go so well in Canada. This is how I see it. Um, we had tremendous political and uh, military leadership. First of all, on the piece about the order. Soldiers follow orders, and sometimes they even have to deal with ones they may not all agree with, but they do follow them. And our senior political and military leaders spoke out about the inevitability of this change. 
the Canadian people weren't shocked by it. In fact, social tides were already changing by the, kind of the mid and early 90s in favor of gay rights, but particularly as they related to employment rights. People just thought it wouldn't be, it, it was unfair to treat uh, people this way in a work context. Military leaders also focused on um, indicating that equal standards would apply for the conduct of gays and heterosexuals, which I think focus more on the behavior than on the transformation of individual uh, beliefs and values. So that was actually quite helpful. The other thing that the Canadian Armed Forces did was to institute mandatory training under the harassment uh, kind of training that's uh, obligatory for all service members. They started using words like gay, lesbian, and giving uh, giving uh, concrete examples. So they also indicated that there was zero, zero tolerance for all forms of harassment and the military leadership backed it up. That was crucial. And I also want to say, and not so parenthetically, that um, the Christian right in Canada uh, was particularly at that time quite small and didn't m mobilize around the issue in 1992. So they didn't um, turn out to be a significant factor. But I'm firmly, uh, I firmly believe that the outcome in Canada, in Australia, in UK, and certainly in Israel, can be replicated here. We all treasure dignity, respect, freedom. It can be replicated here. In fact, even your own um, ambassador to Canada very recently said of our troops who are uh, serving uh, with great courage in Afghanistan, that these troops are heroes, he said of them. They're doing remarkable and effective work in Afghanistan under the toughest of circumstances. Certainly, so are American troops. Gays and lesbians are part of that effective force. So finally, um, for Canada, because we had this fall of discriminatory policy that had been codified in the military, it led to some pretty incredible things for us. Finally, in 2005, uh, as many of you know, the institution of marriage uh, was changed, um, hopefully forever in Canada, such that same-sex uh, couples can be married. Not just um, same-sex marriage, but we are able to fully marry. In fact, uh, it certainly warmed my heart to see in a military, uh, on a military base, in a military chapel by a military chaplain, two male service members uh, married in their uniform. And it's just how it was. So um, it, it's going extremely well, and I, and I hope the same here uh, one day. Uh, finally, um, it's just been a real honor to be part of this fight for freedom. Um, and. I've been coming to the United States since about 1993 to talk about this issue. I'm working with people from the SLDN. I know many of them are here tonight. I commend your work. Um, and uh, I rightly note that Tom has indicated we're speaking in personal capacity. So I just want to, uh, in my personal capacity, indicate my support for your ongoing work. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, our final national panelist, uh, tonight is Avna Ivanzoha from Israel, and he's going to use slides right up here at the podium, Avna. Thank you. Um, so once again, you can see uh, an Israeli soldier marching in the gay pride parade in uh, Jerusalem, and again, if somebody would do something like this in the United States, they wouldn't serve anymore. Uh, with the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, what I'm going to, I'm going to give you a brief uh, literature review about resources about uh, gays and lesbians in the military in Israel. The first one is the Center for Study of Sexual Minorities in the Military. You have the website um, as well. They had a conference in 2000 with representatives from similar countries uh, in San Francisco, and I represented uh, once again the U.S., the Israeli military, and they published a book after Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, debating the gay ban in the military. Again, this book is available. Um, there's another book, Brothers and Others in Arms, by a good friend of mine, Danny Kaplan, who uh, basically interviewed people from elite units in the Israeli army, gay people, about their service. Uh, service is mandatory in Israel, and he really focused on people in elite units um, of the Israeli army and published this book uh, in Hebrew, of course, and then 
uh, in English. Uh, Lee Walzer, who actually resides here in the Washington DC area, wrote a book uh, between Sodom and Eden about gay journey uh, through today's changing Israel and dedicated a chapter about the uh, Israeli army. Again, a great um, resource. Um, this slide just to show you, this is how Israel wanted to see its military in the 60s. Uh, Israel is very proud uh, of, its, uh, of its military. You have um, several units here in, in this uh, slide. Um, the point I'm trying to make is without the military, there would be no state of Israel. Here you can see a map from the War of Independence, 1948, when all the Arab countries, together with the Palestinians, uh, brutally violated the United Nations resolution of the uh, division or separation uh, of, the, of the land of Israel, partition, and then um, attacked Israel. And the blue area is areas that were controlled by Israel the day it was uh, established, and then seven armies uh, invaded uh, to the land. This is David Ben-Gurion declaring the state of Israel on the 14th of May 1948. And again, when he did that, there was a good chance that the state would leave for about a day or two or three days or a week. People were talking about uh, the new Holocaust. The Secretary General of the Arab League was very candid with the Jewish people and said our job is to complete the work that Hitler started. Hitler started the work, killed six million Jews. Our job is now to complete it. And without um, the Israeli military, there would be no state of Israel. Well, these are the borders of the state of Israel today. Um, Christian conservatives in this country uh, often say something that intellectuals or people in the academia uh, disagree, but basically they say the US is a very conservative country. That's why countries like Canada and Norway and Sweden, they can allow gays in the military, but we, in this conservative country of the United States, we can't do it. Israel is very relevant to the debate in this country, because Israel is actually a very conservative country uh, as well. Here you see the chief uh, Ashkenazi rabbi of Israel sitting with the Pope, John Paul, when uh, John Paul visited uh, Israel right next to the Western Wall in Jerusalem uh, in, um, in March 2000. Um, so Israel has uh, a chief Ashkenazi rabbi and uh, a chief Sephardi rabbi. There is no separation between uh, religion and state in Israel. It's a Jewish state, so the state actually pays um, those, those rabbis, the high-level officials, they appoint uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of rabbis uh, to positions in Israel. And the same actually goes for the Muslim population and the Christian population. The state of Israel pays for Christian clergy and Muslim clergy. They're all being paid by the state. Moreover, in every representation in the Israel, every election in the Israeli parliament, um, you can see the division from the 16th Knesset. You can see, of course, uh, members of uh, uh, the Palestinian community, Arab community, are voting and being elected to the Israeli parliament, but also religious parties, 22 uh, mandates out of 120. Uh, the ultra-Orthodox community, they vote. They vote in big numbers, and as a result, they've been a member of almost every government that we've had since 1948. That means that we have ultra-Orthodox rabbis serving as ministers of the government government, ministers of education, interior, and so on and, and so forth. Again, it's a democracy. Uh, they vote. They run for the parliament. They're being elected. The government uh, needs their support in the coalition system. So, uh, so we have rabbis as ministers of the government. Um, just to summarize, why is the Israeli experience applicable to the U.S. and why is the Danish one less so? The U.S. is a conservative country, well, so is Israel. The U.S. military is engaged in an intensive daily fighting. People used to say that even before 9-11, that was the argument that, I heard, that I've heard in 2000 uh, at the other conference in San Francisco. Well, so is the Israeli army. The Israeli army is engaged in a daily fighting against uh, terrorism, against um, uh, uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, you name it. And then, um, when was the last time the French army ever won a war? That's, uh, I don't know if you guys got this email, it was just before the war in Iraq. Um, it was all over the internet that they told people, go to Google and search French military victories. And you know when Google doesn't find anything, they say, do you mean French military defeats? Because that's the only thing that they had. I guess we, we have no representatives here of the French military, so it's okay to make fun of them. So. Um, Google changed it after a few days, but the point I'm trying to make is that the Israeli army is winning wars on a daily basis. If they wouldn't be, when I was a cadet in officer's training in Israel, they told us the truth. They said the Arab countries can and they do lose wars 
all the time. But if Israel would lose one war, the first war would also be the last war, because there would be no state of Israel if we're going to lose even one war. So again, um, these are for the arguments in the United States. This is Professor Uzi Evan. Professor Uzi Evan is a gay person, and he is the, used to be the chair of the chemistry department at Tel Aviv University, a brilliant, brilliant scientist. Um, in 1992, Yael Dayan, the daughter of General Moshe Dayan, who is a true feminist, was elected to the Israeli parliament. And she uh, w chaired the committee for the advancement of women's rights. And she immediately added gay and lesbian rights. And she uh, put together a hearing in the Knesset, in the parliament, for members of the gay and lesbian uh, community. Of course, the ultra-orthodox uh, parties and members of Knesset um, didn't want to have it at all, and as always, they just got more media attention uh, to the event. Uh, representatives came, including Mr. Evan. I remember I was in the military. I was a second lieutenant at that time. And then uh, I just remember driving there with my driver, listening to it in the radio. Uzi Evan was talking about his service uh, for the Israeli uh, military. He was a captain, just like myself. And then once the military discovered that uh, he was gay, despite the fact that he was never trying to hide it, uh, and he did his reserve duty, all men and uh, women do it in Israel till the age of 24, and men um, till the 50s sometimes. So when the military discovered that he's uh, that he has a, a male partner, they adopted a child. Um, he was demoted from from a, a captain to uh, a sergeant. And then this is something that Uzi Evan didn't say, but. Um, how would I put it? Israel keeps this policy of ambiguity, whether it has uh, uh, nuclear weapons or it doesn't. Uh, but since this is a small group here, and we're all friends, uh, I can just tell you Israel has a nuclear bomb. And actually, if you, if you read some publications, about 200 of them. And then uh, with his position as the chair of the chemistry department at Tel Aviv University, Uzi Evan must have had something to do with that, meaning he contributed his academic uh, knowledge and wisdom to the development of the Israeli nuclear weapon. This fact must have been known to the Prime Minister, uh, who was at that time, 1992, also the Defense Minister, uh, Yitzhak Rabin. And then, basically, after uh, people heard Uzi Evan on the radio, they said, well, it just doesn't make sense to discriminate against people who contributed immensely to the security of the State of Israel. I, my advice to Americans is this is how it's going to happen in this country. It's not that suddenly everybody will be uh, uh, human rights uh, advocates and gay rights advocates. No, it's always national security. This is the card that we had to play. This is what happened in Israel in 1992. And that's how uh, the Minister of Defense changed the position. <coughs> um, that's another book about Israeli uh, nuclear bomb. If you don't believe me, um, <laughs> you can, uh, can read it yourself. Okay, so uh, once again, Aaron Balkin and Melissa Levitt uh, put together uh, or published this uh, research in June 2000 uh, about uh, the effect of lifting the ban again. The ban in Israel was lifted in 1993, so it's seven years after that. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but the Israeli military put a policy. The Israeli military didn't have a policy, didn't have a ban against service of gay people. They put together the policy in 1983. The policy was in effect for 10 years, because in 1993, 10 years later, it was abolished. I'm not going to go into that, but basically, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the policy that Israel had for 10 years in 1983 is better than what the U U.S. have uh, um, the U.S. has today. And the reason is that in Israel they allowed uh, each commander basically to uh, to do whatever they see fit with soldiers that they thought were <laughs> gay. And also they said that no action will be taken that may humiliate, constitute harassment, blackmail, threats against soldiers. When you talk to people who were released from the U.S. armed forces right now in 2008, they complain about everything, uh, about harassment, blackmail, threats, all those um, are taking place. This is the amendment from 1993 passed by uh, the Minister of Defense and the Prime Minister uh, Yitzhak Rabin, basically allowing people to serve freely in the Israeli army. Um, and then this is actually the results uh, of, the, of the research that I uh, cited before, uh, basically saying that there was no negative effect at all by uh, lifting the ban.
Okay, President Harry Truman. I actually uh, like to compare the, the ban against service of gay people in the military to the desegregation of the U.S. military in 1948 by President Truman. Um, so here you see a picture from here, the Truman Library of uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers capturing uh, a Nazi flag uh, in Europe. So again, you see African-American soldiers, you see white soldiers together, but at the end of the day, they would go to segregated barracks. They wouldn't live together. And if you read the rhetoric of the Christian right against uh, ser uh, uh, service of gay people in the military, it's very similar. Again, people in 1947, 1948 said what? African-American soldiers are going to shower with white soldiers? That's so weird. That's disgusting. That's never going to happen. Well, it did. Um, uh, here you see the executive order of President Clu uh, Truman uh, desegregating the U.S. Armed Forces from uh, July 1948. Um, and then my point is that that's precisely something that President Clinton could have done in 1993 when he wanted uh, to change the policy. And I'm going to talk about why I think uh, he failed. Um, what President Clinton could have done is just cut and paste the same executive order and just add sexual orientation. <laughs> and then we just wouldn't have this conference here tonight. We would discuss more important things. But he didn't do it. Um, and I think the reason, I actually give him something that I don't give many politicians, but I, I, I I believe President Clinton, he was really, when he was campaigning in 1992 and he told gay people, uh, I have a vision for America and you guys are an uh, important part of it, I believe that he really wanted to uh, change the policy. But President Clinton, before uh, he became president, he was the governor of Arkansas. So um, he was lacking experience in foreign policy because Arkansas doesn't have much foreign policy. <laughs> and he was also the commander of the... Um, Arkansas National Guard, uh, a mighty force. So again, he, 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 he was like in the military uh, experience. So when the generals of the military, headed by Colin Powell, came to him and said, it's not going to work. We have to continue this discrimination. He didn't have the moral authority. He, di he did have the authority, but even the moral authority to tell them no. While Prime Minister Rabin was the chief of staff of the Israeli army uh, during the Six Day War, probably the, the biggest uh, uh, military uh, Jewish victory in, in, in Jewish history. Um, and he was also the commander of the Northern Command of the, of the Israeli army. The Northern Command traditionally was the most prestigious one because it defends Israel against Syria and Lebanon. So I can just imagine a conversation between Prime Minister Rabin and the commander of the Northern Command of the Israeli army saying, um, Mr. Prime Minister, if you allow gay people in the military, I don't think I can defend the state of Israel against Syria and Lebanon. So Prime Minister Rabin will tell the person, you know what? You're fired. Go home. <laughs> what a loser. If you, <laughs> if you cannot defend the state of Israel against Syria and Lebanon just because you have a gay and lesbian, <coughs> you probably shouldn't have this job anyway. The dozens of other generals who would love to have your job. It's the most prestigious job in the Israeli army. But President Clinton didn't have the authority to do something like this. And that's why I believe he opted for the uh, don't ask, don't tell. Um, uh, the Israeli army is so open about it. They have uh, Mr. Gay Israel contest, not in the army. The, the gay community has. Uh, but the Israeli army is so open about it that you can see that in the, uh, in, the, in the magazine, the gay magazine in Israel, which is being distributed in thousands of copies all across the country, uh, they had a picture of a soldier uh, who competed. And here you can see him with his uniform on. Uh, here he obviously took it off. Uh, I don't know if he won or not, but... Uh, do you guys need more time to focus on the picture, or can we move on? Okay, we'll move on. Um, this is the Supreme Court uh, in Israel. Again, uh, one of the reasons that the community, the gay and lesbian community, is so successful in Israel is because this lady, the Chief Justice, Dorit Bainish, uh, who is a great friend of the community, she is the Chief Justice. And then, um, again, just to put it in perspective, because Prime Minister Barak of Israel used to say that uh, Israel is, is located in the Mideast and not in the Midwest. So Israel has a neighboring country, Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, women are not allowed to drive, as to drive a car. They can be in a car, but they cannot drive a car. So uh, in Israel, apparently, uh, they drive all the way up to the Supreme Court. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Avnet. That's very, very interesting. Uh, could someone turn the uh, slides off? Unless... Yes, thank you. Uh, 
Our final speaker is going to be our advocatus Diaboli, and I want to warn <coughs> Avna in particular that <coughs> our advocatus, in addition to his other skills, which I outlined for you, is from Arkansas and was a Clinton advisor. Uh, Shonda. <laughs> Shonda. <laughs> uh, over to you, Mike Rankin. <clears throat> if you really want to know what happened, I'll tell you, because I was there. <laughs> I feel a lot more devilish standing up. I was in that Arkansas National Guard. I thought we held our own against Mississippi in several uh, <laughs> major battles. Uh, Stuart, Patrick, Michelle, and Abner, I've been moved by your comments this afternoon. With your words and even more with your lives, you have shown yourselves to be the best of the warrior class. You have integrity, intelligence, courage, skill, and a deep concern for the men and women in your commands. It's an honor to share this panel with you. I agree with every word you said except about the Arkansas part, <laughs> including A and and the. But <laughs> since they chose not to accept Colonel Field's invitation to come and speak for themselves, I now have the task of speaking for the other side. For those who oppose open service for lesbians and gay men in the militaries of all our nations, Tom describes my role as that of an advocatus diaboli, one who in the Catholic tradition is to take a skeptical view of the arguments of the majority, one who challenges the revealed wisdom. In my Jewish tradition, the closest equivalent would probably be the Dybbuk, a legendary evil spirit who appears in many Jewish folk tales and is the title and protagonist in the best known play of the, of the Yiddish theater. The analogy seems appropriate if my assignment today is to channel Elaine Donnelly, the Ann Coulter of this issue, <laughs> to among many who have been so dismissive of the service and sacrifice of GLBT men and women in all of America's wars, because we've been there for all of them. For those not familiar with Elaine and Ann, if you're from another country, think Margaret Thatcher having a really, really bad day. <laughs> I'll do my best to be worthy of the honor of stating their views, but to be fair, I will quote them exactly using their own words. These are statements I've heard when I participated in debates at Virginia universities, at our war colleges in Newport and Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and I'm sorry to say around my brother's dinner table because he thinks as they do. Though like our beloved vice president, he had other priorities when I was in Vietnam. I'll also quote some of their written remarks. They challenge us on a number of issues. First, on religion and values. They really believe that homosexuality is a terrible sin, one of the worst, certainly the equivalent of prostitution. <coughs> Equally important is the issue of unit cohesion. They're not at all convinced by the argument that another military's unit cohesion didn't suffer when the ban was lifted, or that younger men and women in the military have known friends and family members who were gay or lesbian and are more comfortable with homosexuals than their senior officers. They have counter arguments to all of these. And then there's the shower panic. How can we possibly ask our young soldiers and sailors to shower with these people? Isn't that just adding to the stress they already live with on the battlefield, in their barracks, and on their ships? That sounds absurd to us, but it's deadly serious to them. Because our time is limited, I want to focus on the two most important issues, the value religion issue and unit cohesion. And afterwards, I'll ask my colleagues on the panel to respond. First, religion and values. My old medical school roommate, a friend of many years, worships at a conservative megachurch in Mississippi. On the Sunday before Veterans Day last year, the guest sermonizer was an active duty chaplain from Fort Sam Houston, Texas, a seminary classmate of the church's senior minister. This is a passage from his sermon, which was published in the church's newsletter for congregants who might have missed it or wanted to share it. Speaking in uniform, an impressive array of ribbons on his chest, the chaplain began on a high note. My friends, the homosexuals are at it again. This time their agenda is to force the military to accept practicing homosexuals. I know you're as outraged by this as I am. Serve with a homosexual? I'd sooner serve with the whore of Babylon. Having a homosexual in your barracks, in your battalion, on your Navy ship, is like having a baby's dirty diaper on your dinner plate. I am not making this up. I wish I were. He continues in a like vein. 
Friends, we read in the book of Genesis that God created Adam and Eve. We do not read that God created Adam and Steve. God's judgment on homosexuals is right there in the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 22. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. An abomination, my friends, an abomination. Yet when I point this out to the liberals and ACLU types, I can hear their snickers. I see their smirks and raised eyebrows. I feel their mocking. You should not lose the, use the Bible to make decisions about our military, they say. There are men from many faith traditions in our armed forces. Your way of believing is not everyone's way of believing. Your values are not everyone's values. You must respect everyone's religious beliefs. My friend, it's true that not everyone is saved. But if they demand that we respect their values, why can they not also respect ours? Why do they object to our calling our Pentagon ministry, the Pentagon, a Christian embassy? That's exactly what it, we want it to be. And why do they belittle our chaplains who consider our presence in Iraq and Afghanistan a God-given opportunity to bring Muslims to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? We battle every hour of every day against the homosexuals and their allies. And my friends, they are powerful, more powerful than you can imagine. If only we were. <laughs> Unit cohesion. Three years ago, I debated Elaine Donnelly and her military supporters at the National Defense University at Fort McNair here in Washington. A retired Marine 06 was the most vocal in his demand that we keep and strengthen the ban. Afterwards, he gave me a copy of his statement with his notes in the margin in case I missed something he said. I'd heard him loud and clear. Captain Rankin agrees with us that unit cohesion is important, that soldiers and Marines have to trust those they fight alongside, but he assures us that in the militaries of other countries where they allow homosexuals to serve openly, unit cohesion has not been adversely affected. I seriously doubt that. I've spoken to senior officers in those countries who say it has been adversely affected, very much so. But even if it hasn't, we are not other countries. We are the United States of America. Our young men are not hanging out in the bars of the Yorkville section of Toronto. They're not dating actors from the West End theaters in London or prancing up the street in women's clothes at homosexual festivals in Sydney. They are not congregating on nude beaches in Tel Aviv trying to pick up an Israeli soldier. <laughs> are there nude beaches? Wow. No, our military men are from the farm towns of the Central Valley of California, from Cleveland, Atlanta, and Dallas, from small cities in the South and Midwest, and they are aghast when they are told they have to sleep next to some flamer from Greenwich Village or the Castro. They know they have to watch their backs in the showers with these guys so they won't be assaulted. It's stressful enough just being in Iraq and Afghanistan. Why add to that stress? Don't they deserve better?" End quote. Would any of my colleagues like to respond to this? <laughs> I, I can comment that I have actually picked up an Israeli soldier. Um, <laughs> um, I, I have to be very careful what I say here, lest I say something which is sort of unfortunate. But I, I know that my straight colleagues sometimes complain about the mechanisms of brass straps, and all I can remember was that he had an Uzi slung across his back, and I couldn't quite work how to remove it um, <laughs> w without doing either of us a sort of fatal uh, uh, mishap. Um, I, in terms of religion, um, all I can say is that uh, out in Afghanistan um, at the moment, um, there are uh, British uh, men and women serving alongside American men and women, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, sadly and increasingly so, um, they are not coming back whole or alive. Um, I'm quite certain that they're there to perform a job, and in terms of religion, I would just say one thing, uh, greater love hath no man than he that he lays down his life for his brother. In terms of unit cohesion, um, I'm reminded of a uh, time uh, about 10 years ago when I was on Radio 4 uh, early in the morning, um, that's a BBC sort of news program, um, discussing um, this issue. Um, we had a um, certainly had a diaboli uh, on the program. We had a fairly neutral um, um, interviewer. Um, we had the commanding officer of the 2nd Parachute Battalion. Um, our parachutists have a fine reputation, like many of your special 
uh, formations and units. Um, and he obviously didn't really want to get drawn too much on the debate. And towards the end of it, the interviewer uh, turned to him and said, Colonel, surely you must have um, a view on this. And he said, well, um, I was interested in your comments about unit cohesion. All I can think is that if I was on the front line um, in a dugout uh, under fire and I could have the choice of two of my top marksmen to be in that dugout with me and one was a bigot uh, and one was a gay man, um, I would always choose the gay man because I would trust his judgment more. Now, from my perspective, unit cohesion, it's about doing the job. Um, these are professionals we're talking about. Um, our experience in the British uh, military since our ban has gone is that that is what people are focused on. Um, they're more interested um, when they're in the showers of washing off the mud, uh, the sweat, and sadly, occasionally, the blood and the tears mm -hmm. rather than anything else. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, other comments from other panelists on our Diabolus's challenge? Um, I'll, I'll talk just quickly about the unit cohesion issue, especially since I've just come back from Iraq recently. Um, the, the men and women that I served with in the US Embassy over there were amazing people. Um, fully knowing that I was, was gay it was not an issue. I mean, if it had been such a large issue, I'm quite sure that the US Meritorious Service Medal I was awarded while I was there would never have happened. And that was signed off by a four-star general. Um, obviously, my work there was worthy. Um, the people that I worked with were quite content with my work. Um, since the ban lifted in Australia, has anything changed? No, it's, it's actually probably made our teams more unified than anything else. Um, one of the, the biggest things that, that I value is honesty and integrity. Um, if you're honest with yourself um, and, you know, and with, with your colleagues, that, that really brings everything home. Um, if, and I've, I've said this a couple of times um, over the last few days, um, if you're to lie about your sexuality, you're going to lie about something else. Mm -hmm. We want honest people in our militaries. They joined to serve our country for a reason. Um, so we need them to be upfront and honest. So that cohesion is, is very important there that, you know, um, yeah, I don't see any issues. And one thing that I did say earlier this morning, this is the religion issue now. Um, in Australia, our chaplain's prime role is to look after the welfare of our own, um, regardless of their religious background, regardless if they have a religious background, they're there to look after the welfare of the troops. Um, I was entertained a few years back. I went to one of the Sydney gay and lesbian dance parties and um, I got tapped on the shoulder by this person. I've turned around and there's this guy in these little pink hot shorts with his cross on his chest. <laughs> he was one of our naval chaplains. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, and, and so that was great to see, you know, that he wasn't worried, you know, he was there. And, um, but having seen him at work and with people and dealing with people's issues and that, um, first-rate chaplain, um, and I could not say anything negative about him at all. Um, and, and the same with our other chaplains that we've got. Yes, some don't like the idea of gays in the military. However, the majority of them, they understand that their purpose for being is for looking after the welfare of our individuals. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Further comments? I can almost not leave the bra strap comment and the rifle slung <laughs> comment. Uh, uh, I've slightly been lost in thinking it, it's just not that hard, Patrick, on the bra strap. <laughs> It can be overcome, you know, <laughs> leaders can overcome difficult challenges, but, you know, I mean, right, um, you know, rhetoric and increasing volumes of rhetoric doesn't make it right, I mean, we know that, and um, religious views and my right to serve, his religious views don't trump my right to serve. I, I can't imagine anything more beautiful than, frankly, the way you put it, Patrick, so uh, I, I won't add anything further. We're approaching the point at which we are going to ask you folks to participate through your questions. Uh, Tom, I just wanted to... But I did, did want to ask our panelists whether they had a few further questions, and Avner clearly wants to defend himself. Avner, over to you. 
Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say about religion, again, Israel is a, is a, is a great example for that because we have some ultra-Orthodox religious soldiers and recently they came up with the thing that they don't want women to be military instructors and commanders for them because traditionally when they go and pray in a synagogue, the women have to be separated from them. And again, the military said, we're sorry, this is the military. You can do whatever you want in your synagogue, but once you are uh, in the military, you have to do that. So again, the same goes for, um, for gays and lesbians. And the, 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 the issue of unit cohesion, I find it even a bigger question. The, the question is, who does the military belong to? Because if the military, I think there's a, there's a group of people who says, well, since the military belongs to us, since this, this is our private army, we can pick and choose whoever we're going to serve with. It just doesn't work like this. You cannot say, I don't want to serve with women, I don't want to serve with African Americans, gays and lesbians, I don't like all together. It, it just doesn't work like this. The military is the, actually the, uh, the biggest employer in this country. And if we discriminate against people, you know, I, I gave this talk in the Castro in San Francisco, and some people were saying, why is it important to us in the gay community? You know, it's not that if they're going to lift the ban, we, we're all going to join the military now because we have jobs, we're attorneys, we're doctors, we're well-to-do. And, and the answer was, it's not about you. It's about those uh, teenagers who grow up in, in Georgia or Alabama, Mississippi, in Texas, in small towns that they can either work in McDonald's or in, or in uh, uh, Walmart, and then, because uh, that's the only way to get out of those uh, places, and then they are being discriminated because uh, if they are gay and lesbian, they want to get out of those little towns, they cannot join the Navy or the military forces like everybody else. This is precisely the definition of discrimination. And, and I loved what he said, we are the United States of America. When I grew up, the United States of America was an emblem, was a symbol of liberty, of human rights, of democracy. Now, uh, the United States is the only country in the Western Hemisphere, the only wet Western democracy that still discriminates officially, legally, against gays and lesbians. This is the shame. Thank you, Avna. The, uh, could I ask you, Helen, if you would, to turn on the microphone for questions? And I'd like to ask the panelists while that's being done. Uh, there's a, in the back, there's a tiny little, tiny little, that's it, and there you are. Uh, okay. Uh, our court reporter is, uh, has pleaded for mercy as well. Uh, the uh, the conference is being transcribed, and the first thing that we will notify you about after the conference is over is the availability of the transcript and the videotape uh, of the conference uh, on the web. <clears throat> I wanted to ask whether the panelists have some other questions that they would like to ask one another before we turn to audience questions. Tom, could I share another uh, yes. chaplain story? I'm on my Navy ship in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. This is about 1965. And a young man comes in to me um, in sick bay and asks to see me. He's obviously distraught, really upset. And I ask what the issue is. And he says, um, I'm afraid I might be gay. And I said, OK, um, let's talk about that. What is the issue? Are you worried you'll be kicked out of the Navy? No. Um, are, are you wanting to get out of the Navy? No. What is the issue? I think God will condemn me for this. And I said, well, that's not, not my way of, that's not the way I understand God works in the world, but I'm Jewish and you're Protestant. Uh, this kid was from a little rural town up in West Virginia. I think you need to see the Protestant chaplain. Now the chaplain on our ship would have handled this beautifully, but he was on leave. So I sent him to the chaplain on base. Kid came back, uh, old, I told him to get in touch with me when he got back and we would talk again, but things got busy in sick bay and he didn't. And then the next afternoon, I think this was the 4th of July, we were having a softball game. The softball field was very close to the border between Cuba and the United States, and there were mines between the uh, fences there. He played in the, on the, uh, ball, on the uh, softball uh, team, which I coached. And in the middle of the first inning, we look out and he has gone over the fence and is out in the minefield. One of the other sailors from the ship went over that fence, got him and held him in his arms until we could get a map of the mines, they were the mines that we had laid, 
and get them safely out. I got him back to uh, sickbay and I said, what in the world happened? He said, the chaplain confirmed what I thought. He said, God will really condemn you for your feelings toward men. And I really don't think you have any path toward salvation for having this. And he said, that being the case, I thought I might as well just end it now. I learned something from that. First of all, I learned never, ever refer to a chaplain you don't know. I never did that again in my whole 24 years in the Navy, ever. And um, I also learned that in every Navy hospital, we had a little underground group of people that we knew that were either gay or lesbian or supportive that we could refer to. I happened to know one in the hosp Navy hospital in Philadelphia, which was where we were referring at the time. And I sent him up there and, uh, and he got very good care there. But that was something that, that was the time I really learned how good chaplains could be because the guy on our ship was great or how bad they could be, how dangerous. Never forgot it. All right, time for audience questions. And it's very important that you come to the microphone and tell us who you are. Yes. Thank you for breaking the ice, and welcome. It's taken me a long time as a straight person to speak openly. Um, I have been a nurse for 40 years. I was in the Army Reserve, National Guard Reserve for 21 years. And I found the gay issue to be a non-issue. I am horrified at all the energy that's put toward that when it just doesn't show up. And yet there's all this energy that's not being put to the rapes. And people that say they've been raped, they get ostracized. And I'd like some comments about that. Uh, by the way, could you identify yourself? Um, Wendy Shuford. Uh, just one moment. We're going to get that microphone on yet. Wendy Shuford from Baltimore. Thank you, Ms. Shuford, very much. Thank you, Wendy. We, we uh, looked at that issue in Canada. In fact, it was an American study that um, was able to quantify this a little bit statistically. I think it was Aaron Belkin's work. Um, but when the ban is lifted, women actually feel safer to come forward, to bring forward um, uh, complaints about harassment, mm -hmm. sexual discrimination, um, or worse. Uh, when there's no ban, because then there's not the corollary effect of, of having someone think that they're lesbian. They can just bring forward the assault, the harassment, or, or whatever the nature of the complaint. There's actually a strong feeling by the women in the Canadian military that this was relieving for them, uh, that they could bring these things forward um, and not have someone say, well, what's wrong with you? Are you gay? You know, and, and so it's, it's actually been a bit of a mercy, I think, for, for women that they don't have this kind of second wave of discrimination, regardless of whether they are or uh, are straight or are gay. So um, it's actually been quite helpful, and there are statistics on that. And I, I, I think that would actually be borne out here, too, if, if the change uh, and when the change is made. Um, women will feel uh, some relief from it. And there are, you know, I think um, in my case, because I'm a woman, it was actually a little bit easier, I think, in Canada than perhaps a, a case brought forward by a man. There were about five cases going forward at the same time. And certainly I had a very, I think, on the facts, a very good case to, to be argued. But some of the um, lead counsel that were kind of working on these cases, I mean, looked at this issue and, and what would almost be a, a better case to bring forward. And as I say, the facts were there, but it was somehow slightly easier, I think, that I, I'm a woman for the senior male leadership um, to, to get behind this more quickly. Um, not all of them, the top, the chief of the defense staff was, was very good regardless, man, woman, but um, Others were not quite as, as comfortable, so uh, it, it helped. More questions. Hi, my name is David Stibe. I'm a student here at the Law Center. And I was wondering if in your countries, transgender individuals are able to serve in the military. Let's just <clears throat> take a poll, starting from Stuart and moving leftward. Um, I, I can't answer that question at the moment because I didn't come prepared for it. Um, but I believe that post-op, yes. Um, but yeah, I, I've got to do more research on that one. Sorry. Uh, from the British uh, perspective, it actually predates our ban being lifted. Um, the answer is yes, they may. Um, 
there is no problem with it. Um, why should there be a problem with it? Um, in terms, it's, it's bad doing the job as ever. In terms of uh, gender reassignment surgery, um, if they would be entitled to it under our state health system, known as the National Health Service, then they would also be entitled to it within um, the military. It's not an issue. In Canada, yes, and they'll also pay for the sex reassignment surgery. Uh, in Israel, they can serve. There was a, a case of a, a female to male soldier who uh, joined the military about a year and a half ago. And then uh, I, th I think the state of Israel, the national health system, pays for some of the sex uh, um, change uh, operation, but not for all of it. I might add that uh, one of the individuals who uh, we interviewed in preparation for this conference was a serving British soldier. Uh, a member of one of the parachute regiments, which is to say one of the toughest uh, units in the British Army, uh, who is at this moment undergoing transgender uh, male to female uh, transition. And that's the reason why he could not be our panelist. Uh, no problem, no difficulty. He will continue on active duty. He has a distinguished military career. Uh, but he will continue on active duty in a different gender. More questions? Hello. Can you hear me? My name is Mike Mazza. I'm a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh and also a veteran of service in Iraq and Afghanistan. And my question is this. It seems to me that um, those who argue against lifting the ban in the United States, behind their argument is an assertion that U.S. personnel as a whole are lacking in professionalism and lacking in the emotional maturity needed to um, manage this, this uh, change to lifting the ban, and also that the leadership of the U.S. military is lacking in the competence needed to manage the ban. I was wondering if uh, any of you wanted to comment on that whole phenomenon. Let's, uh, let's the, um, have the Americans on the panel, uh, namely Rankin and myself, take a crack at that to begin with. It's one of the arguments we use uh, against those who uh, claim we're not capable of, uh, of accepting uh, GLBT people in the military. Uh, it's not been very persuasive to them, but uh, it is one of the arguments we use because it's, it's certainly a fallacy that the military cannot accept different people. When I joined the Navy in 1963, I think it was, or four, African Americans were predominantly, although they were integrated, they were predominantly integrated into the, to the deck service, which was the equivalent of the janitorial service, and into the kitchen. Uh, and it took a long time and a lot of very well-meaning people to get rid of that particular uh, discrimination until get to the point where uh, an African-American could be chair of the Joint Chiefs. So it takes a long time, but it takes leadership to do it. Clinton, I think, had he had the leadership um, supporting him, could have made it work. Uh, there's no question but that the, the uh, integration could have happened. But Colin Powell absolutely refused to be a part of it. Sam Nunn refused to be a part of it. John Warner refused to be a part of it. He, Clinton asked them. And they all said, no, we're not going to help you, and we're going to fight you all the way. Had any one of those, had all those th three been uh, willing to go for it, it would have happened. Further comments from the panel? Um, I've, I've just got one sort of perspective. Um, again, it's what I referred to when I was speaking about having one's finger on the pulse. Um, I arrived here on... Uh, Saturday evening, about an hour and a half delayed, courtesy of uh, unpleasant weather. Um, and uh, I then had about an hour and a queue to get through what we call immigration, but I think you call customs and border protection. And when I eventually got to the front of the queue, um, there was this sort of uh, tall, sort of handsome, all-American sort of uh, um, border officer in his black and silver uniform with a nice smile on his face. And I thought, way hey. Um, uh, and, um, um, and he said, uh, welcome to the United States, sir. Uh, can I ask what the purpose of your visit to the United States is? And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm here talking um, at a conference at uh, Georgetown University about military readiness. And he said, oh. I was in the US Marine Corps for six years. 
and I thought, shall I try it or, or, or shall I not? And, um, I said, well, it's actually military readiness and sexuality. And he smiled and looked at his colleague uh, and looked back at me and said, well, you know, I just don't understand this. You know, if, so long as they can shoot straight, what is the problem? A and waved me on. And that was probably a record sort of time in terms of clearance. Um, so it obviously wasn't a problem for him. We offer that, Your Honour, as anecdotal evidence. <laughs> Further questions? Uh, Denny, we have someone behind, I think. Okay. We're lined up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Denny Meyer, Gay Military Times, Aver, and Tava Public Affairs. Uh, we've, we've heard that uh, straight people have had no problem in the countries where the ban has been lifted. We've heard from relatively senior people uh, who went through the transition. Has there been any research studies in your countries? of young people currently joining who are gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender, and what their experience is now joining where they can do so openly. Obviously, they're not registering as gay and lesbian, but is there any, any indication of their experience as being different from having gone through the transition? Um, I think in Australia, and especially since we've just had Mardi Gras not too long ago, and the number of young men and women that decided to join us this year um, sort of shows that there really isn't too much of an issue. Um, they, they've grown up with it through school and through college. They've come into the Defence Force um, knowing full well that it's accepted and it's an open policy. Um, so they're more willing to, to share their, their private life, you know, that they have a same-sex partner or that they are gay or lesbian um, without fear of discrimination. That's the, the biggest thing, um, you know, from when I joined prior to the ban, still not understanding, but knowing a lot of people that were in before the ban was lifted who really had a hard time. And even after the ban was lifted, a lot of us still had difficulties adjusting to being able to speak open. Um, so yeah, I, I would have to say in Australia, no, th there hasn't been any studies done, but the attitudes of the younger generation coming through the system are very positive and, and very accepting. Um, I, I tend to echo that up. Uh, recruitment sort of uh, um, vehicles um, normally turn up at our pride events there. Mm -hmm. um, we normally expect to see the, the Army, Navy, Air Force uh, vans with everyone turned out looking very smart um, at Brighton or London Pride. Um, we haven't actually done uh, any research. Uh, perhaps we should. Uh, I'd just like to correct one thing, Danny. We, we, we did have difficulties. It'd be wrong to say that um, we didn't. We all had difficulties. It, it is a difficult issue, and you know, you, one cannot deny that. It's how one manages it, and it's the approach taken by the leadership, which will dictate how easily um, and how well it is managed. Further comments? Yeah, I just want to say something about Israel, and, and I think it's true about other countries. It's, it's, um, it's very difficult to find research. The, if you look, uh, the most uh, dated research I found in Israel was from 2000, and the issue is not published because it's not an issue. I think all the countries who lifted the ban, it's not an issue anymore. The only place where it's still an issue is this, the only country which still discriminates, which is the United States. I think, um, I find it very interesting that, uh, and again, I compare it to the desegregation of the U.S. Uh, uh, Army in, in 1948, that uh, no distinguished professor in this university would have a serious research about the effect of the desegregation now. Because what would be the finding that the blacks and white can serve together? Like, how refreshing is that? No, 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 no professor would, would really do something like this. It's the same in those countries. In Israel, it's just not an issue. Once it's not an issue, nobody really researches it anymore because nobody's really too interested. It's just you move on. We had two, actually, two uh, questioners, uh, one of whom I think got a little discouraged with the uh, speed of questions. Oh, I see. Okay, fine. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, I'm Lee Ji Hyung uh, of the Law Center. I came here partly for the free food, but this is really interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was warned that the food was an essential part of this celebration. 
<laughs> and uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned that, um, that the gay, gay and bisexual uh, servicemen are treated the same as everybody else. And I was wondering if that was the, that was the same for survivor's benefits and such, uh, especially in countries where there is no legal same-sex marriage, like whether civil unions and such would be treated, treated the same. Uh, so that's my question. Um, in Australia, uh, a couple of years ago, the Human Rights Equal Opportunity Commission did a review of federal legislation and found 58 pieces of legislation that were discriminating based on sexual preference. Um, within defence, while the defence forces now recognise same-sex couples for internal entitlements such as housing, relocations, financial um, benefits internal, um, the Department of Veteran Affairs is still to catch up. Now their, their legislation is tied up in that 58 pieces of legislation that's currently under review um, by the, the, the new government. They, they are expecting superannuation is another big one um, that is on the books right now. We've just done a review within Defence and passed our findings back on to the government um, and supporting that same-sex couples uh, are entitled to superannuation and death benefits and so on. To, just to translate for the audience, so superannuation uh, means pensions. Pensions, yeah. <laughs> um, so as at, right at this stage, no, um, but it is currently under review by the federal government and, and I would expect that that will be resolved within the next 12 to 18 months. Um, from the British perspective, the answer is uh, yes, we, we got uh, civil partnership rights uh, across the United Kingdom uh, the year before last. Um, the armed services had, had learnt their trick and were ready for that. So uh, married quarters would then be available um, to any military personnel um, who, who actually undertook a civil partnership. Um, by law, um, any other rights um, accrue naturally. So it, yes, it's, again, it's been a bit of a non-event. Um, and uh, um, they, you know, it's no different from if you were um, a straight couple. In Canada, for sure, uh, since the mid-90s, uh, we've had fully equal treatment on pension rights, survivor benefits, all of that. Actually, survivor benefits did take some time to work their way through court challenges, but uh, there's full equality in terms of what is able uh, to be extended to an opposite sex or a same-sex partner. Um, so it's completely equal. Avna? Yeah, it's the same in Israel. There was actually an interesting case in the late 80s. So uh, actually, this, uh, the survivor benefits actually predated the lifting of the ban that uh, we had a colonel and he, he was divorced. Uh, he died and then his uh, boyfriend uh, um, asked the Ministry of Defense for a pension. And again, the Ministry of Defense denied it. But if you read the court documents, the Ministry of Defense kind of pushing him politely to go to the Supreme Court and says, we cannot change the rule, but the Supreme Court can. The Supreme Court in Israel is very liberal, and the Supreme Court was asking the government to compromise. The government did not want to compromise, and then they lost all the way. And now, um, and now it's um, basically based on the Supreme Court ruling. Another question. Yes, uh, my name is Dave Halpern. I'm entering law school in the fall. I don't know where I'm going yet. So um, my question is, is uh, I'm gay. And, Come uh, here. We have a very <laughs> interesting faculty. Yeah, but my question is, I'm gay, and my best friend uh, is straight. I was best man at his wedding. He said he would be best man at my wedding. Um, and he was telling me <laughs> how he has friends that, you know, who are straight and have gay friends, and they're very tolerant. Uh, but one of their concerns was uh, that with the showering, one of their concerns was sort of that if they were in the same stall, it would sort of be like they were like a straight man would be showering with a woman, kind of like sort of a comfort kind of issue. Like, how do you sort of like have different countries sort of address that in different ways, like the showering concern? Or well, whenever I get up, uh, whenever I'm on Capitol Hill lobbying. Uh, eventually, whatever questions or objections have initially been raised to what I've had to say, uh, we eventually get round to the shower issue. So I want to hear how our other panelists handle this one. 
Stuart? Um, a, a funny, <laughs> funny story. That's shower in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> we wash each other's backs, no. Um, a, a, a funny story that happened to me, I just posted on to my second ship, um, HMAS Melbourne. Um, the rumours had hit the ship before I arrived that I was gay and all that sort of stuff. Not a big issue for me, I didn't really care at that time. But I was in the, in the shower area brushing my teeth in the morning and then this guy got out of the shower standing next to me stark naked and starts introducing himself, you know. Oh, Oh, g'day, you must be the new leading, leading seaman on board. And knowing full well that I was gay, because I, everyone had known by this stage. Um, was it an issue or a concern? No, he didn't care. He was there to get showered so he could get out and go to work. Um, and exactly the same reason for me. Um, generally speaking, you don't know who is gay and who is not. You know, um, and before the ban was lifted, who knew who you were showering next to? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's again not a real issue um, I mean we've got shy people that don't like showering in front of other people you know not because they're gay or lesbian it's just because they don't like to be naked in front of other people well that, that's fine the military is probably not the right place for them but <laughs> um, you know but yeah again so Australia yeah not not so much a big issue Patrick when the Canadian military was prepa preparing their defense of, um, uh, against the, the lawsuit that I brought, they actually advanced what they called six men in a tent theory. And um, it, it was, you know, kind of the notion of the predator predatory gay male and the disruption to uh, the, 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 the five other, I guess, presumed straight men in the tent and what, what great damage would be done by one gay man in a tent. <laughs> and as we proceeded, they dropped that because uh, I think the profound embarrassment that would have uh, resulted when that was tested and, and came out uh, in court, um, I, I just think they weren't prepared to subject um, the uh, chief of the defense staff to defending the theory of what happens uh, with six men in a tent. And, um, you know, because uh, people are fatigued and they're tired, and it's just really this kind of perpetuation of these odious kind of um, sentiments about gay men. And, um, and again, I think it, it was easier for them to, to talk about gay men um, that, and demonize them and, and advance these terrible kind of odious um, myths. Um, and they've relied on them for years. It just, you know, <coughs> as far as anything I've ever heard from talking to, you know, people like Stuart, Patrick, and others um, over the years, and colleagues that I knew from the military, it just, it just didn't happen. And in the Canadian context, I think that the leader said, well, then we will now deal, if there is a problem, with that as a problem of, uh, of, of aggression or a problem um, of, um, you know, a breach of a military rule, which is you can't violate another soldier. Um, it, and so in that sense, it was um, easier than tackling the notion of just, you know, this myth of the predatory gay male. But they continue to use it. Um, it just needs to be tackled head on, I think. Uh, I think from the sort of, uh, fr from my perspective, uh, um, uh, you know, on a serious sort of uh, um, note, um, the code of conduct which uh, mm -hmm. um, governs um, sexual behavior um, between serving personnel um, is an important thing. I mean, mm -hmm. people are human. Um, and the Code of Conduct lays down what is acceptable and what is not acceptable behavior. Ours no, makes no mention whatsoever of sexual orientation because it applies equally, whether it's male-male, female-female, male-female. So uh, th there is you know, a code which should be followed there. Um, and if people step out of line with that, then they should be dealt with accordingly, and that's very clear. On a less serious note, uh, just thinking about the six men in a tent issue, um, as someone who has actually spent uh, a night with five other men in a tent, I, I, can, um, um, I can assure you that, that the key issues are A, who's going to snore the loudest, yeah, right. and B, who's got the smelliest feet, yep. and that any other issue really does not raise its head. You know, uh -huh. I, I just might also add that, that in further preparation for this lawsuit, the military also costed out in Canada, um, they, they costed out how much uh, it would take, uh, the, the real dollars and cents, to convert every bathroom uh, associated with a military institution in Canada. And they found to, this was to accommodate uh, lesbians and gays that they would like create a whole new separate 
bathroom structure. And they found that they could do it. It was going to be expensive uh, until it came to submarines, and then it was just prohibitively expensive. So, but they, but they actually kind of you know, conducted these types of studies. And I think when they started to put them forward and they were, you know, put out there as, as evidence that they were going to lead, it just became such an embarrassment. And even they knew that, you know, to, they would just be ridiculed completely in, in an open court uh, if, if those kinds of things were advanced. But, but they stand there and you can actually, you know, look at how much it would cost to convert every bathroom in a Canadian military institution. It's fascinating. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, before lifting the ban in Israel in 1993, Danny Kaplan found in his book that so many gay people said that there was a policy, maybe an unwritten policy in Israel, to send gay people to submarine units. And he asked them, why do you think people were sent, people that the army suspected were gay, were sent to submarines, which is probably the most difficult place to serve. And the reason was uh, totally unrelated to that, but um, they wanted people who would be very intelligent. The army thought that gay people are very intelligent. Uh, and then uh, people who would serve well in the military for three years and maybe four years, but wouldn't want to become officers. And that's what they thought, that gay people would serve the extra year, but they wouldn't want to sign up and become officers because in, in, in submarines you have only two officers and you have dozens of other people um, serving. So I just found it interesting that the military, without the government telling them lift the ban, send gay people to the most to the harshest place to serve, a submarine, just because of totally other reasons. At least they wouldn't have to run up a pair of curtains or, or anything. Of course, you've got no windows, which is something else they might be good at, or um, so so certain people might think. Yes. Uh, last la last question, but one. We, we can entertain one final question after yours. I'm Sister Dorinda Young, one of the Catholic chaplains here at the Law Center, <laughs> and I certainly appreciate each of your very powerful testimonies. Thank you. Uh, this is more an observation on Michael. Um, I was so appreciative of the criterion that you stated in determining the worthiness of a chaplain's capacity to give pastoral care. Mm -hmm. I'm one of five chaplains here at the Law Center. We are an interreligious team, and while none of us would look very cool in hot pink shorts, oh. trust me, <laughs> um, I think that we really are, are known for being extremely hospitable and welcoming to our entire Law Center community. I have the privilege of knowing many of our gay and lesbian uh, students here, and they are such a joy. Uh, we work very closely together. Uh, I, I just wanted to make that observation that it's possible uh, to be in an interreligious staff that, uh, that appreciates everyone. I'll say to you what people say to me. Thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there a final question? Uh, yes. One kind of segue question. I'm Albert Lauber from the faculty here. And I had one sort of scary thought during Abner's talk, which it was that could it be the case that we'd be better off with a President McCain than a President Obama or a President Hillary Clinton in trying to get the ban lifted in the next four years. Who wants to take a crack at that one? <laughs> he has said that he would not lift it. Uh, Obama and, Mc and Hillary have both said they would. Um, that's my only answer. Yeah. Uh, McCain has said repeatedly that uh, the ban, quote, is working, unquote. Uh, I leave it to you to judge whether the U.S. ban is working uh, in light of what you've heard this evening. The, uh, I am hopeful, in light of his recent writings, that one of McCain's principal military advisors uh, former Joint Chiefs of Staff Chair Colin Powell is beginning to see the analogies between Truman's efforts in 1948 and the current situation. Uh, if you believe in prayer, I urge you to pray. Could I comment on that just briefly? Because I was one of the ones who went to Colin Powell when Clinton was trying to end the ban and try to en enlist his support. And we made the worst possible mistake. We used the analogy of discrimination against African Americans, compared it to discrimination against gays. 
his statement at that time, this was 1993, was that homosexuals can wake up and become heterosexuals. Blacks can't wake up and become white. And we could not believe that a man of that intelligence and that experience and that uh, sophistication would believe that. But that was what he told us. So if he has now changed his mind and had some, what we Jews call tshuva, some turning toward uh, the right, God bless him. So thank you very much. Tessa, what are you up to? <laughs> Hi, I'm Tessa Marmy, and I'm a third year student here, and I'm the uh, president of the Military Law Society. And um, before we get around to thanking our very distinguished panelists, thank you so much for coming. And I'm sure the audience will join me in thanking you all in a moment. Um, I just wanted to thank Professor Tom Field on behalf of the Office of the Dean of Students and all the student groups that helped to co-sponsor this event. Um, it was really inspiring working with Professor Field. He had such vision and dedication for months and months and months. It's incredibly hard to get a panel, uh, especially an international one, of um, such caliber. And I just wanted to thank Professor Field for his effort in bringing this to our community. Thank straight home to my wife, and she'll appreciate them a lot. Thank you so much. There's all sorts of goodies out there. Please go eat them right now.